So what goes into the other two thirds? <laughs> right? During this surge in adolescence, how is it that we cultivate beyond the 27%? <laughs> and here is where science has started to suggest there's some tools, there's some practical ways for helping children and adolescents develop their spiritual life. And that if we do, set this up with the teen by say, early adulthood, it is sustained for the rest of their adult life. It is sustained in their daily lived experience that they walk on spiritual bedrock. It is sustained in the work they do and the relationships they keep. And it is even sustained in their neurophysiology. Everywhere that you see red is a region of the brain that we found in our JAMA published article to, be, to show a thicker cortex in people my age with a sustained personal spirituality. It's a significance map. It shows the regions of the brain where a thicker cortex is found in people with a sustained spirituality over the life course. The cortex is processing power. Thicker cortex is associated with IQ, thinner cortex with Alzheimer's. What's particularly interesting about these regions is that they're the very same regions of the brain, thick with sustained spirituality, to be thin in people with recurrent depression. And to be thin in people in families loaded up for depression. As a sidebar, the effect was greatest. There was the greatest flourishing in the cortex associated with spirituality in people who had the greatest family risk, suggesting that biology does not equal depression. Heritability may offer a sensitivity, a sensitivity to either have more spiritual engagement or left willy-nilly see less spiritual engagement, but it is a capacity, a sensitivity that either flourishes and shows thickness with, with spirituality or left willy-nilly thinness. So this individuation process is the ideal jumping in space because teens are accessible to us, because this is the platform from which the spiritual brain is built over time. Individuation, as you know well, is the grand testing, the me and not me of the world you've given me, mom and dad. And it can sometimes feel like we're being evaluated, <laughs> but we're only the stand-in for the deep work that they're doing, trying to figure out ultimate questions. And what might feel like a push away or a slap in the face is actually them doing the work of really wanting to know if the way you've taught me about spiritual connection touches my own heart, if the way that I've learned from my friends about spiritual connection is real. They're working hard, and sometimes it's the most aggressively questioning child or disgruntled child who's actually doing spiritual individuation. When that's set up, the rest of the work of adolescence starts to look different. So if we think about the classic jobs of the adolescent, identity, work, relationships, with a spiritual hub, identity becomes about meaning and purpose, and work becomes about contribution and calling, and relationships are less about whether you're interesting to me and more about if I can take an interest in you. From the seat of the spiritual hub, adolescence unfolds differently. Now, left willy-nilly, the teen doesn't have all that much to go on because our culture tends to be very performance oriented. And without a voice to complete the 27% up to 100%, the self is viewed as the performance self. I'm just about as good as my last baseball game or my recent math test. And the performance self is a fragile self because it's only a matter of time until 
I don't win the baseball game. And even if I do, it doesn't last very long because it doesn't ultimately fill my cup. There's a lot of performance self that gets handed out to teens. And the performance self judges itself and other people on outward success. Relationships are appetizing, pleasing, furthering, as opposed to spiritual opportunities for deep commitment, sharing the journey.